So my name is Mark Krejci, I work for Wilson Art, and I'm here to really talk to you about why, why Wilson Art, why choose laminate over the other surfacing materials that you have options to choose from. In, in the marketplace, we sense that our customers are becoming increasingly more sensitive to the social implications of those purchasing decisions as well as the environmental implications of those purchasing decisions. There are a lot of surfacing solutions that are available to the marketplace today. Why choose Wilson Art as one of those solutions? If you ask anybody at Wilson Art about our products, you'll find that they pretty much will say that high pressure decorative laminate is one of the most sustainable materials available to the market today. Why is this? Why can we make that statement in such confidence? I mean, after all, we make plastic laminate, right? And plastic comes from crude oil, and crude oil is a non-renewable resource. How can we make this statement with any confidence? We can make it because if you look at the way laminate's manufactured, you find that 70% of the weight of a laminate is composed of wood fiber. That wood fiber is FSC certified. It comes from FSC certified forests. Those are really tree farms that grow trees like a corn crop farmer would grow corn, only they harvest about every 15 years. They use sustainable harvesting and foresting practices. So it's, these are wise, well-developed business models that have stood the test of time uh, for many years. Much of the wood fiber that we make laminate comes from sawdust. That sawdust is a w waste product or a byproduct of the timber industry. When timber is turned into lumber, about 50% of the lumber is usable. So the remaining 50% of the waste that's produced is either used to make paper, and like in our case, the craft paper that we use to make our laminate, or energy, they burn it to run the plant, or they use it to make engineered substrates like particle board or MDF. If you look even deeper into the way we manufacture and the raw materials we use, you'll see that 20 to 30% of the laminate mass is composed of recycled fiber. These are old corrugated cardboard boxes that are used to ship products to places like Walmart and Target. These are places that have the volume and the logistics that are necessary to in fact make it efficient to collect this fiber and use it to manufacture our craft paper. We do have a few skeletons in our closet. Um, we use resins. These resins come from petroleum based products. Crude oil is the raw material supply that's required to produce phenolic resin and our melamine resin is natural gas is used to provide the raw material supply to produce melamine resin. Wilson Art manufactures sheet goods. So our sheets have to be handled. And the craft paper is saturated with phenolic resin because that phenolic resin provides the toughness to the craft paper so it can be handled and machined without chipping or breaking. The melamine resin provides the clear, hard, durable surface that maintains the integrity of the decorative layer for the lifetime of the laminate. So we take this whole assembly of paper, and resin systems and we put them in our presses in, in the facilities we have in North America and we put pressure on them and we use this chemical technology to turn this laminate, these paper-based products into a durable good, into a consolidated contiguous structure that is represented by high pressure decorative laminate. This is a square foot of high pressure decorative laminate. If you were to actually take this laminate apart into its constituent parts, you'd find, as I mentioned before, it contains this particular laminate contains one layer, one sheet of recycled craft paper. It contains one sheet of virgin pulp produced craft paper. On top of that, there's a decorative layer okay, that provides the pattern and the color. And then there's a protective layer, an overlay, okay, that, that we use to saturate um, and deliver melamine resin to the system. So if we look at the resin systems that we use, the craft paper is saturated, about one square foot of laminate contains about this much phenolic resin. About one square foot of laminate contains about this much melamine resin. And about one square foot of laminate contains about this much aluminum oxide. So we add the phenolic to give it toughness, we add the melamine to give it durability, and we add the aluminum oxide to improve the scratch resistance of the surface to again improve the durability. So the question I, I get when I travel and talk to people about this is, how do you turn, what is it that we use, what's the foo-foo dust that we use to turn a paper product, which is not durable, okay, into a durable, re in, into a durable surface, right? We talked about the resin systems, but what, what is it about these resin systems, what is it about the chemistry of these resin systems that force this liquid to turn into a solid and consolidate into this durable surface? Well, we use the F word, right? This is not formica, it's formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is the reactive chemistry that's necessary to, to turn these liquids and paper materials into a durable surface. 
now is probably a good time to talk about the different types of phenaldehyde resins that are present in the marketplace. There's a lot of confusion about what types of formaldehyde are, are, are good for you and what types of formaldehyde are more dangerous. People were really familiar with urea formaldehyde resins. They're not so much familiar with phenol formaldehyde or melamine formaldehyde resins. Most of the press has sensitized people to urea formaldehyde because that's the formaldehyde system that was delivered to the homes in Katrina that created the big formaldehyde issues in the news. Though that particular type of formaldehyde system is very unstable. And you might remember in the 1970s, they developed blow-in insulation for interiors and homes that already had, had been constructed but hadn't had insulation put in them. They'd come in and drill a hole into your wall, blow in insulation, and what they found was they used urea formaldehyde as the binding system to deliver that, that, that fiber as insulation. Well, the wall is moist and humid. Those conditions create conditions where the urea formaldehyde resonance is unstable, and the formaldehyde is released from that urea formaldehyde resin. Phenol formaldehyde and melamine formaldehyde resins aren't sensitive to those kinds of conditions. The formaldehyde is very tightly linked to the phenol or the melamine, and it doesn't release uh, with moisture and, and uh, heat very easily. So our systems, in fact, um, uh, are very stable, and as a consequence, that re release very small amounts of formaldehyde. So we use formaldehyde. So does everybody else. Formaldehyde is a globally is a 60 billion pound industry. The United States uses about 10 billion pounds of formaldehyde a year. You find formaldehyde in products in, like cars. If you drove your car today, there's some engineered thermoplastics that are under your hood that are formaldehyde based. They make these parts this way because it's an efficient way to assemble the car. It reduces its weight, improves its fuel efficiency. You find formaldehyde in the textiles that are used to make clothing. The shirt I'm wearing is a wrinkle-free shirt. I buy these kinds of shirts because I don't iron very well. So I can put it in the dryer, warm it up, takes the wrinkles out, it'll stay wrinkle-free. That's, that's formaldehyde chemistry. It's coated onto the fiber that creates that, uh, that permanent press-like look. Um, spandex is also a fiber that's used, um, that's the ba that's, its basis is in formaldehyde chemistry. Formaldehyde chemistry is also used in the pharmaceutical business to sterilize um, vaccine formulations so that if they use real viruses, they become more safe. It's used in the coatings industry to coat pharmaceuticals so that um, those pharmaceuticals aren't released in, the, in, in, your, in your stomach, they're released in your small intestine. Okay? It's a natural product. It's a natural degradation product of cellulose. So if you cook vegetables that have fiber in them, that cooking process, the process of softening that occurs during that process, it involves the degradation of the cellulose and all, releases small amounts of formaldehyde. If you use cook with gas, heat your water with gas, um, or generate electricity with gas, all of those things produce formaldehyde as a byproduct. It's used in the hair care products. If you have really curly hair, hair is made from keratin. Uh, formaldehyde can cross-link keratin, so if you have really curly hair and you want it straight, they have this thing called a Brazilian, where they straighten your hair, they add formaldehyde chemistry, and it cross-links the keratin and retains the straightness of the hair. And finally, formaldehyde is used in the formulation and synthesis of and manufacture of uh, slow release fertilizers. Um, it's a coating on the outside of the fertilizer. Uh, it slowly dissolves and it's a much more efficient delivery system for giving the plant nitrogen over its growth life instead of injecting uh, nitrogen directly into the ground in the form of ammonia or adding straight urea to the ground which often dissolves in water and gets washed away. Wilson art is classified as a low emitting material. Okay? It emits less than 7.4 parts per billion, and that allows us to qualify for the SCS Indoor Advantage Gold um, that follows the California specifications for measuring. Most people have a difficult time trying to understand what a part per billion is. This is a, this is a unit of measure that scientists use to describe materials that are in very, very small concentrations. And this is sort of an, a visual illustration of what a part per billion is. Right? This is, uh, astronomers tell us this is a galaxy that looks lots like our Milky Way galaxy. So if we could get outside our galaxy and look back in, you'd see this, a spiral galaxy that looks like this. Those same astronomers tell us that about, there are about 300 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, we have to look at really big numbers in order to see really small numbers like a part per billion. So I put a red dot on this screen that sort of illustrates this, the space that would be occupied by 10 parts per billion in this 300 billion uh, star universe. Can you see it? It's right there. Right? I chose 10 parts per billion because, in fact, that's the number that the Health and Human Services Department determined was sort of background level for everywhere. So if you're in an interior space, 
um, you're being exposed to about 10 parts per billion. If you go outside and stand on a corner where there are a lot of cars going by, you get exposed to about 100 parts per billion in formaldehyde. Okay, so it's a, it's a reasonable number. Maybe, maybe another way to describe it for people who are used to numbers is, if you owed me a 10 parts per billion of a million dollars, would I care? Right? I wouldn't because it's a penny. Right? So if I had a million dollars in my pocket, would I care if you took a, a penny from me? No, it's a very, very small number. So the point here is not to, not to take away from the fact that formaldehyde is a dangerous material. And when you're using it in the manufacturing environment, you have to be very careful with it. And we monitor our employees as a consequence of that very strictly. And we implement processes and procedures to take care to make sure that their exposures are limited to within, really to beyond what the specifications require in terms of regulations. So what's the issue here, really? What am I trying, the point am I trying to make? The issue really is that modern technology has developed instrumentation that allow us to measure very, very, very small quantities of things. But the toxicological science to support whether these materials exposure to these very small quantities is hazardous or not hasn't caught up with the ability to measure these quantities. So there's a raging debate going on within the toxicologists' um, schools of thought. There are really two positions that toxicologists take. The first position is any amount of exposure to any amount of any toxin material is hazardous to your health for any amount of time. It's called the linear no threshold model. Okay? And then there's the other school of thought that's called, it's a, it's a threshold model. Okay? It says that as long as you're exposed to um, levels below a certain threshold, it poses no danger. Okay? You get above a certain threshold and there's the dangerous situation. Most of regulations that are, that are developed in the United States are based on threshold type models. This is the model that I sort of personally like because it's more consistent with my common sense and in in, in my common experience. If a doctor prescribes a medication to me, he prescribes a specific dose, like for example, pain medication. If I take less than the pain medication required dose, I don't get very much relief. If I take too much, then I'm in trouble, right? There's a specific amount that's, that, that, that gives me the benefit of the pain medication but doesn't provide me with the hazards associated with it, right? If we look at, say, something like iron, our bodies require iron. If we have too, too little amount of iron, we typically get anemia. We're short of breath. Our heart rate is rapid. If we get too much iron over long periods of time, we can develop liver cancer. And also things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease are linked to overexposures of iron. So this, again, tells me th through that experience that a threshold type model is more consistent with, with, with the way things work. But the debate is still raging, right? The point here, Albert Einstein is one of my heroes. He makes a very eloquent statement here that I think really sort of sums it all up. He says, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. So he says, you know, basically, just because you can measure it doesn't mean it matters, right? So what really matters with laminate? Okay, what counts? What counts is we have access to digital information. We can use this information to accurately replicate digital images that are either in the mind of the creator or in the mother nature creates for us. Okay, we couple that digital information with high fidelity printing processes and it really creates this palette of texture, color, and pattern that's unparalleled by other materials okay, that are available. So what value does this deliver to our customers? It allows us to create stone visuals that don't do this to a mountainside. It allows us to create exotic or tropical wood visuals that maybe ha are involved endangered species without having to cut the forest down. Okay? It allows the designer, really, to create abstract designs that are only limited by their imagination. And it delivers these deep, solid, rich colors. We can do all of that and create textures separate from the original designs. Mother Nature doesn't do this. The kinds of materials that are naturally available that we can replicate are stuck with certain ranges of textures. But we can combine texture, pattern, and color independent of them all. So we can incorporate very regular textures like that represented by that wicker weave up in the top right hand corner to very random textures like this uh, fractured stone surface that maybe is like a 35 or 45 finish to metallic or highly gloss finishes. So what this does for the designer is it gives the designer the ability to balance the aesthetic value of a surface they're trying to create with the performance specifically required for a particular application that surface is going to be involved in with the budgetary constraints that are involved that we all have to deal with and still integrate sustainable values into their interior space by utilizing a material that's 70% bio-based and renewable. Okay? 
and we deliver that value proposition with an organization that uh, staffed by employees that are committed to serving their customers. This is Wilson Art's purpose in the marketplace. It's what allowed us to take the majority share of the market. We serve our customers. So that's where we are in today. Where is the future going to take us? So we're listening to what our customers are saying about this whole idea of sustainable materials and the practices and how important that is for, for them to integrate into their stories. So we continue to act to become more transparent um, by engaging the Pharos project and helping them understand and, and list publicly what materials we use to manufacture and the processes we use to manufacture uh, our laminates from. We're engaged in developing products and processes that reduce our reliance on petroleum. We're looking at non-food grade bio-based sources of chemistry for the resins we use to manufacture our laminates. We're trying to incorporate no more recycled product in recycled fiber into our product. Um, maybe if, if you were to look at this recycled paper, you'd see that it was a little rougher than the virgin paper and that prevents us from putting it up really close to the decorative layer without imparting an adverse texture to the surface. So we have people that are specifically looking at how do we make recycled paper uh, out of fiber that doesn't have such a rough finish to it so we can get more of it close to the decorative layer and incorporate more recycled fiber into our product. And we're exploring new processes and business models that will deliver more efficiently these high quality surfaces that we provide to the marketplace that you use to develop these aesthetic values in the interior spaces you, you're designing. We know these are really important steps to a successful path to our, our future and your future. Okay? And we know that innovation is going to be directly involved in that because we know innovation is really about seeing the world as it could be and doing something about making it that way. So we need to partner with our customers. This is why we're reaching out to our customers. We want to see the challenges you face, and then we want to be involved in the processes of developing solutions to those challenges. I have two sons. My youngest one, his name is Nicholas, and he's really gotten into rock climbing. So we were visiting this last week about what is it about rock climbing that he finds the biggest challenge. He said, Dad, it's not about climbing the face. It's about trusting my equipment. It's about once I've climbed the face and I'm standing on solid ground and I'm beginning to rappel down the rock, I have to put my faith in my equipment when I transfer all the weight from the earth to the equipment. Wilson Art really wants to be that, have that kind of relationship with our customer. We want, we want to be the equipment you use to be successful in the marketplace. We want you to trust, right, that the products that we manufacture won't compromise the health and wealth for those people that use them or manufacture them. We want to trust that we're utilizing our resources in a way that's wise that will either sustain or improve the standard of living of future generations. And we want you to trust that Wilson Art is making the decisions necessary to ensure that we're in business in the future and we'll be able to deliver products to you in the future. Sustainability really isn't about a product attribute. It's really about that trust. It's a corporate value. It's how we manufacture. It's how we live our lives. It's how we treat our employees. It's how we treat our customers. It's how we treat the community that surrounds us, right? It's that it's rooted in trust, okay? And we want to take that trust and develop it. This is really what the Wilson Art First Full Circle program is all about. It's, about. it's about trust through transparency. It's about sharing with the public our journey our sustainability journey, allowing you to see the things that we see as challenges and share in the successes we have towards those challenges. And we want to leverage that trust really to, to make a successful future for all of us. Because as Alan Kay once said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Thank you.